My name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'll be your MC for tonight. Um, to kickstart proceedings, shall we please welcome Mr. Jonathan Oppenheimer to give us a welcome address. Thank you. Mr. President, President Hichilima, President Obasanjo, uh, we have many representatives from various governments, ministers from this country, and premiers. Uh, I think, David, you're here somewhere. Uh, but uh, if I could uh, suggest that all, all protocol be observed, thank you so much. It's an incredible privilege to have your good services and support this evening in looking at something which is truly, I think, critical to where we're going in the future. And uh, the work that Greg has done in expensive poverty is nothing short of groundbreaking. Not in that it says something we don't already know, but because it says so clearly and so succinctly something we already instinctively understood, but had never articulated particularly well. And the very essence of what we need as Africans is to be able to attract capital to grow. We need to be able to create businesses, create activity, create skills so that we are going to prosper and our children and our grandchildren must prosper as well. We cannot just consume in our generation. And the lesson that came out of Greg's book, lesson that I was reminded of again and again and again, was and is the one, the parable of teaching a man to fish. What aid is very good at doing is giving a man a fish. It's not good at teaching a man to fish. And what we need to do, and I encourage those governments here who are donors to think long and hard, is to think about the lasting legacy of what they are doing and how they do it not necessarily at home where they come from, but here in Africa where that money is deployed. And if they do it well, there will be institutions and activity and training and skills left behind. And those institutions and training and skills will generate the growth that we need for ourselves, our children, and the generations to come. We also, at this moment in time, are confronted with an incredible challenge of climate change. And that is very difficult. When you're poor and you don't have the resources, changing your economic base is hard. But at the same time, there is an extraordinary opportunity to embrace new technology. And Africa has proved a master of leapfrogging the rest of the world, whether it's the development of digital uh, pay tools such as M-Pesa in Kenya, some of the work that has been done in terms of greening the economy, uh, the ability to embrace solar, for example. And if we are very clever in how we do that, we reduce the non-productive, what I have a nasty habit of calling non-revenue generating costs of both investing in and running those things that will transform our economies. We will be able to uh, do things which very few other people have done. And uh, I'm not going to steal the podium for too long, sir, because I think that we have quite a program this evening. We have your speech, we have President Obasanjo's speech, we also have the opportunity uh, to be here in this extraordinary museum. And I'd, I'd known of its existence, but I'd never visited. And I am kicking myself for that failure. And I would encourage everybody here tonight to take an opportunity after this to just experience this amazing, incredibly well curated exhibition of something that we must ensure never happens again. <laughs> Tali Nats is the founding curator and director here, and she's going to tell us a little bit about it, and so I won't steal her thunder. But suffice to say, we have to grow Africa, and we have to grow Africa in a way that is environmentally sustainable. 
And to do that, we have to attract capital. And my challenge to every single person in the room today is how do we do that? How do we make the most attractive opportunities present themselves here in Africa, ideally here in South Africa as well? And how do we do that? Not in five years, not in 10 years, but tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, Mr. President, thank you all. Uh, Tali, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Shlima, President Vasanjo, ministers, uh, wonderful, wonderful guests, Mayor of Joburg, which is our partner uh, in this museum, and of course, all of you that came here today. My name is Tali Nates. I am the founder and executive director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and would like to warmly welcome you to our home. It is a great honor to welcome you today to this important book launch of Greg Mill's book, Expensive po Poverty. Thank you, Greg. Why aid fails is what we are going to look at and as a place where we teach about choices, as a place that looks at memory activism, I think this book is crucial in getting our continent, our country, to a place where aid is indeed not needed. So who are we? The Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center is a pub public-private partnership with the city of Johannesburg, and it officially opened only in March of 2019. It took about 10 years to found the building and curate it, as Jonathan, you said, very carefully and thoughtfully. Perhaps when you walked in, you saw the words of Auschwitz survivor and writer Primo Levi that warns us and cautions us and says, it happened, therefore, it can happen again. This is the core of what we have to say. It can happen, and it can happen anywhere. And in a way, it is critical to deeply reflect and learn from this warning. We need to serve as a catalyst of memory activism and this is the core of what we do here in this center. It is a center of memory, education, dialogue, as we are going to do today, but also lessons that we can learn from the past. We cover in a very multi-directional, non-linear, thematic way genocides in the 20th century. We start in Namibia with the of the Herero and Nama genocide of 1904. We look at the Christian Armenians that were murdered in, under the Ottoman Empire during the First World War. We look at the Holocaust during the Second World War. We look at Rwanda and the just genocide against the Tutsi there in 1994. But we look beyond that. We make connections to crimes against humanity, we make, con we make connections to mass atrocities and to the history of South Africa, the history of uh, colonialism, of racism, of apartheid, and also reflecting on what our country is facing today and what our continent is facing today in a very multifaceted way, including art, music, poetry, that you usually do not see in a museum. We are really invested in develop citizenship skills, and that is why this works so well to launch this book here today, because we need to make the connections between the past, the present, and our mutual human future. Our building, as you can see, is full of symbolism. There are railway lines, there are trees all around the building 
that witnessed mass atrocities and genocide. Uh, the railway lines are a clear symbol, of course, of genocide, of the Holocaust, but also connects to control, exploitation on the African continent. Other journeys that we invite you to think about are journeys of those fleeing human rights atrocities today. So what we do, and you see it all around you, there are windows in the museum because we want you to connect to the fact that atrocities, genocide, crimes against humanity, human rights abuses do not happen in darkness, do not happen during the night. They happen during the day while the world watched and is still watching. So what do we have to do about it? Finally, in 2017, Together with Aegis Trust, the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center launched a new youth leadership program called the Change Makers Program. This is a collaborative, cross-African regional program that empowers institutions and individuals to promote pluralism and democracy and counter extremism. This project uses history, the history of apartheid in South Africa, the history of the genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda, the history of the Holocaust. And it aims at the African continent to assist leaders to find African solutions for our local problems. And I'm pleased to tell you that the program, including its Train the Trainer, to teachers, facilitators, and thought leaders, is now in 13 countries in Africa. And President, I launched the program in Zambia in the end of November 2021. It was a great, great honor. We also launched it in Nigeria in 2018, and we were in Yola, Adamawa State, launching this program with youth professors and indeed, teachers. And we developed many resources together, and now we are developing case studies together. And that is important. So finally, if you visit our exhibition, you will see photos of two survivors, side by side. Both volunteer at our center. Irene Klass is a Holocaust survivor from the Warsaw Ghetto. And Sylvester Sendakieye is a Rwandan survivor of a massacre at a church in Gitarama. Irene says, I thought that when the world learned what had happened to us, it could never happen again. But it did. Sylvester responds, and a genocide happened yet again to us here in Rwanda, in full view of the world. They suggest that the world did not learn from history. The question is, with the help of your book and with the help of all of us here, can we? Thank you very much. Uh, up next is a man who is no stranger to the African continent and the world at large. Um, we are very privileged to have him as the board of the Brentes Foundation. He's also the ex-president of the Republic of Nigeria. Please help me welcome to the podium President Olusegun Obasanjo. Mr. President and brother, Jonathan, ministers, premiers, Nick, and the distinguished author and my co-worker and friend. My case on this occasion is like the case of a church leader in our country. And he came to the church, he was not warned 
that he will lead the prayer. And he was suddenly called upon to say the prayers. So he got up and said, I am surprised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, I was not warned by Greg that I will be making a statement here and um, well, he, because my friend and brother is coming and he said, well, will you be here? I said, of course, I will be here. Um, then as Jonathan was making his speech, Greg said to me, you will make a speech. I said, no, that was not part of our bargain. <laughs> he said, but uh, you are the chairman of Brentford Foundation. Well, and there he, he got it right. I don't know what got the better part of Jonathan. He decided to make me the chairman of Brentford Foundation. And... Um, Very good decision. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, I want to say that this book, I don't know whether Greg will agree with me, probably the inspiration for this book came from our work in Ghana. When we gave Ghana the what, of course, is our uh, work in the Brentford Foundation, strengthening Africa's economic performance. And we did that for Ghana. And we, the, the theme was beyond aid. And um, President Nana took that and ran with it. And I believe from that, uh, uh, Greg got the inspiration, like he always gets, to look more into aid. And you couldn't have got a better title for the book, Expensive Poverty. Why didn't aid work? I think if you look in this book, you will see. But as we said in our work on Ghana economic uh, transformation, we have to go beyond it because we have seen that it has not worked and it will not work. I think we have to come to that and then The capital, as Jonathan always says, that we need is beyond what aid can give us. But the capital is available. Again, I learned that from Jonathan, that the capital to develop, to transform Africa is there in Africa and outside Africa. It is how to access it. And part of what the book is saying is how to access and how to do what we have to do to transform Africa. And it has to be, we have to get it right. And the work we do in Brentford Foundation is to help countries, states, even communities within countries to make, to help them to get it right. I never stop referring to my experience with Lin Kuan Yew. I took about 40 young African leaders 
to Singapore and um, at his request, because I asked him to come and address them, he said, bring them to Singapore. And I took them. And for two days, he spent time with us. And the young African leaders were anxious to get the magic. And they said to him, what is the magic? And his answer was, there was no magic. We did a few things right, and we continue to do them right. Not only did they do them right, but they continue to do them right. Our problem is, what are we doing right? And if we know what we are doing right, do we continue to do them right? If we do a few things right, and we continue to do them right, we will get there. And what this book is all about is to make us get a few things right and to continue to get them right. Greg, once again, I congratulate you and commend you for always writing. And having partnered with you on a few occasions to write, I know what you do in writing. You have influenced a lot of people. I'm more grief to help. Up next, we have a very special guest with us tonight. I'm sure we also are walking in. The newly elected president of the Republic of Zambia, President Hakainde Ichilema. He's already causing some very positive waves. And I read a statement that he made. He said, it is your right to have a state without corruption. And I felt that was a very profound statement, especially for leadership on the African continent. Uh, with a standing ovation, please. Can you please help me welcome to the podium <laughs> President Akainde Ichilima. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please take your seats. Thank you very much. You are giving me too much credibility. I must earn it. Let me see if I'll earn it tonight. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues, in this beautiful place. I'm sure we are all happy to be here. Um, the location itself insists that we must learn lessons all the time, good lessons, not bad ones. Ladies and gentlemen, Director of Ceremonies, I'm delighted to be here today to be with you. Um, good people, a good number of whom we have known each other for some time. I want to express my appreciation of the hospitality accorded to us, myself and my team, since we came into this country, South Africa, and truly to pay a special tribute and recognition to President Obasanjo. President Obasanjo is nice, useful to call him former president, but President Obasanjo continues his presidential duty many years after officially leaving office. I don't know where he gets his energy from, but truly, he's a barber of Africa. I do remember that to many of us, he's done a lot more things than the public are aware of. I see a man seated in front of me wearing a hat who is also able to confess 
that President Obasanjo is more than a friend. His family to many of us on this continent and beyond. I do remember that in April of 2017, I was picked up from home by not less than 300 armed men in the night uh, and subsequently thrown into maximum prison for treason. And many people were afraid of even mentioning my name, that they knew me. And um, this Baba, amongst a few other people who were courageous enough, actually co came over to Zambia and engaged the authorities then and worked thereafter, after he came to prison to see me, without fear that he could also be thrown in and worked very hard to ensure that I was safe during the many days I was in incarceration, but also to work to get me out of there. And um, it's strange that today I'm introduced as president of Zambia, from prison to president, and he contributed to that. Um, to that effort. I want to pay special thanks, appreciation to the Oppenheimer family, um, represented tonight here by Nick, by Jonathan, and indeed Mrs. Oppenheimer for your support over years in many ways and for doing things that some businesses don't want to say even a word about them to foster democratic space, support democratic space and other activities on our continent the Brent Hess Foundation is one such activity that this family has been supporting and doing great work in our countries for our people on our continent and beyond. So we're grateful to you and indebted to you. If many other similar families and the people in this room know what I mean, and businesses were able to find space, time, resources to do what this family has been doing, we will all be better in one way or another on this continent and elsewhere. So thank you. Thank you very much. I must also indicate here, because if I didn't, I'll be failing in my duty, that um, our relationship with them has come with some challenges and sometimes non-factual innuendos which are absolutely necessary to some people but a small number of people but to the majority of us completely not worth using valuable time to talk about because 90%, 100% of the time, those innuendos were completely out of context and wrong. So there's another lesson there, that they continue to do what they thought is right. We must stand behind what we believe is right, all of us in this hall and beyond. When we do what is right, we retain our normals and we actually get more successful in what we do because we stand by what is right. I must say that one of those issues 
is around this perception that if an African public pers personality, a politician, a president, believes in the rule of law, believes in enterprise, believes in growing the economy, capital, mobilization, that's necessary, as has been said, then that president is equivalent to what you may call a stooge of somebody. That is not true. If this word, because, let me just emphasize this point, because if one has to be defined to be a stooge of somebody or some people, because you do what you believe is, is right, it cannot be right. But I have accepted, and I'm here to make a confession tonight, that if doing what is right for oneness people, to give opportunity to oneness people, all of them, without segregation, amounts to be called a stooge, then I confess that I'm a stooge for the people of Zambia. The truth is that Zambians, like most Africans and other people, want to live in an open society, an accountable society, where governments are not working for themselves. Personalities in government have not accessed public office to gain personally at the expense of the people of Zambia, in our case and other people in other countries. Honestly, that's what I know and I believe, that Zambians want a better life. They want the economy to be functional. Children want to go to school. After school, they want to find something to do. Work. Young people are the majority in our countries. They want school, they want you know, college after basic education, they want jobs, they want business opportunity, they want to work for themselves. Truly, this need cuts across race, continent, it's universal. And I think we who genuinely want to lay a claim on providing leadership, we must accept that this is a bare minimum. And mobilizing resources, making sure that aid doesn't lead us to abject poverty, managing our resources, tax resources derived from the people, that those resources are applied for the greater good of the people. I think that's a bare minimum that political leaders here tonight, we respect you, civic leaders, mayor of the city of Johannesburg, all of us in that space, working with the private sector, ought to know that it's our duty, a bare minimum, to work prudently these resources to mobilize capital that will lead to generating benefits for our people. I think then we'll be worth to be called leaders. I fundamentally believe in that. We are here to pay tribute to the author of the book that is being launched tonight, Dr. Greg Mills. I have known Greg for many years. A couple of years, many years back, he pitched up, I don't know what he was doing, in Lusaka at the Holiday Inn. And I don't know who gave him, his, who gave him my number. He just called me up. This, this fellow calls me up and introduces himself and that he wanted to have a cup of coffee with myself. And I went there, we had coffee, and from there on, our relationship evolved over many years. Greg, from that time, has continued to support us, 
to assist us develop our regional and global network of friends. Of friends, a global network of friends. Life, to a large extent, is anchored on networking, is anchored on finding people you share common values with. Then your friendship can be sustainable. He worked very closely with our team to support that we believed in, that the country called Zambia can be run by Zambians, networking with others in a much better way, in a way that will deliver benefits for many. And he, like the Oppenheimers, got his fingers bent not once, not twice, but many times. But Greg and our friendship continued to this day. I believe it will continue even tomorrow and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, this book, Expensive Poverty, offers not only a rearward view at what has gone wrong and how donors and Africans have often spoke past each other. Instead of talking to each other with each other, they have spoken past each other. Greg has looked at this issue in quite an elaborate but succinct way. In our pursuit of development as countries on this continent, We face many challenges. We work with different people. We get support from different sources. But it is important that we use this support, we talk to each other properly to structure this support in a way that delivers maximum benefits for all that are involved. I believe the donors want to see development in the recipient countries. The recipient countries want to utilize these donations in a manner that will add value for all our citizens. Greg has done more than analyzing this rear view, as I said. He's looked at how we can make, how we can make this relationship, this support beneficial. Expensive poverty provides both a set of principles and strategic ideas behind how we can make this relationship prosper. It is remarkable what Greg has done, this son of Africa, and I want to address black Africans. Africa is our continent, black, white, brown, because today, we marry each other. We love doesn't know that distinction. And so if we say Africa is for a certain color, that is wrong. What about our children? <clears throat> born out of love, isn't it? How can something born out of love be unwanted? It doesn't make sense, isn't it? So thank you, Greg, son of Africa. We are proud of you for the work you've done in this expensive poverty uh, book. I must turn to Zambia a little bit, say a few things about our own country. As an example, only as an example. Let me take Zambia and share with you a few things. How we have let our people down as leaders and how we are going as a new government make amends in future to ameliorate the situation that should have never been allowed to degenerate to where we are today. 2021 was a landmark year for Zambia. Two important events occurred in our country. First, unfortunately, the passing on of our independent Zambia father, 
Freedom Struggle Father, the ANC will remember this individual very well, Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, passed on in 2021. Most unfortunate, may he so rest in peace. Another area issue is our election in August. The people of Zambia voted decisively and voted for change. Two critical events in the past year, just past year. I mentioned the passing on of Dr. Kaunda because Zambia has strong roots in many areas. In part, these roots are anchored on Dr. Kaunda and what he stood for. Remember earlier on, I talked about beliefs, values. Our foundation partially sits in this gentleman who is gone. He was a person who sought to save ordinary Zambians. And even if some of the policy decisions that his party promoted may not have yielded results as intended, his intentions were well-meaning. His intentions were genuine. I think we need that in leadership. We do need that. We wish that he would have lived on just just, he died in June, just a few more months to have seen the transition that took place in August. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last decade, we have witnessed the erosion of our economy, largely arising from poor leadership and a breakdown in the rule of law, fundamental breakdown in the rule of law. It can cause damage and it did cause damage, it has caused damage in our country. As a consequence, our debt mountain went up, very unsustainable debt, but from my training, if you are acquiring a liability or liabilities such as debt, the principle of double entry means the assets must sit somewhere. But we increased our debt, the other side of the equation, there were no assets. The economy declined. If you drew a, a graph, you would see the economy growing into 2011, 2015, change of government, leadership. From there on, the graph went down and down to a point where the economy, which was growing in 2011, GDP at 7%, now we are less than zero, so minus. This is what leadership, and when fundamentals break down, capital will not help us in that environment. Capital must be coupled with good leadership, well-meaning leadership. I think that's the message we are giving here. Our national budget has been overwhelmed by debt service. Unproportionate debt service obligations, which is ways has weighed down the economy. Corruption has worsened things. Fortunately, the people of Zambia decided that enough was enough and ushered in a new government in August, it happens to be our government, from prison to president. <laughs> this is to us, to the Zambian people, a new opportunity for a better life, for a better Zambia, and the people of Zambia call our government a new dawn. That's what you hear being said. Another remarkable thing we want to say, this change of government leadership was the third peaceful democratic transfer of leadership since the advent of multipartism and democracy from the one-party state three decades ago. Some message there. It was an African election success 
yet under difficult conditions. And I think other African countries can pick some little lesson from here that we can actually change governments in a democracy peacefully. Even when leaders that are in office at a particular time create conditions that are almost impossible to effect change of government. I think this is success for Africa. And we must nurse and grow this culture. It is notable that the African Union Election Observation Mission, headed by the former president of Sierra Leone, President Enes Bayekoroma, played the role of wise counsel, wise elderly statesman, and stepped in to ensure that we had a smooth transition of power. From the 12th of August, we voted on the 12th of August, 13th, we, were, we knew we had won the election, but there was no declaration. It was tense, true sometimes, unfair, negative African behavior, leadership, which we must all walk away from. When our time comes to go, we must go. We must go. <laughs> but after a few days, President Koroma and his colleagues were able to bring us together with the exiting leadership and ourselves, and we agreed that the nation and the people of Zambia are more important than any one of us. And I think a peaceful transition happened. The road ahead will not be without challenges, but with a clear vision and a plan with a relentless determination, we believe and strongly believe so that we will deliver on the aspirations of the people of Zambia. We have no doubt about that. It will be difficult, we know, we understand. The erosion of value that I talked about is deep, but we think that there's a reason that we've come in at this time as a team. And I've always told my team members, cabinet ministers, that this is not a joyride. This is hard work, based on what we believe in. That if we don't grow the economy, despite being African, coming from extended families, loving each other, wanting to give somebody who is in need, there's something that is true. Something that must be accepted by us on this continent. We cannot share poverty. We cannot share poverty. We need to grow our economies. We need to mobilize capital and use that capital prudently in a manner that will be seen by many whose needs are diverse in our countries and that they can access opportunity out of this good leadership, good management and use, utilization of the so mobilized resources from the continent, as we have heard, from Baba, as Jonathan indicated, from outside the continent. I think we can do it. So we can make poverty the biggest enemy. Not a yellow African, not a black African, not a white African, but poverty as the biggest enemy. Even when we access aid, We can't build our economies without encouraging investment. It's not possible. This is the mentality of sharing poverty. It's not possible. We should not be afraid of being called names to do the right thing. The right thing is to mobilize investments from our own people in our countries, from our own business houses, from others around the world. We need to harness technology. We need to harness skills. For us, we are clear that 
we need to harness the resources that God gave us as a country, resource endowments, in their diversity, including the minerals. With the climate change that is now accepted, that it's here, it's real, because many did not agree a few years ago that climate change was real. Now we all agree it is here. With the pandemic, we need to be more prudent. We need for us to take advantage of the electric car industry that is coming to deal with partially climate change, carbon fuels that have partially caused this damage. Now, in Africa, in the world, there are 14 countries that host, if you like, battery metals to support the electric car industry. And of these 14 countries, it's a debate, I don't want to get into it, seven of these countries are on the African continent. And the leaders of this pack of seven is Congo and Zambia. So we need a Zambians and other countries, South Africa has some of those minerals, some of them. I want to waste your time, copper, cobalt, manganese, nickel, lithium. We need to utilize these resources, mobilizing capital, technology, working with ourselves. And I was saying when I met President Ramaphosa today, that the first core of us working together is within our countries, next step, is within our region and on our continent before we extend a hand to Europe, to China, to America. <laughs> when we have done that, we'll be able to face together. And this is where we should not draw a distinction between government and private sector. We're one. We want the same things. If we are able to work together in this manner, we will be able to face Europe, to face America and China in a way that we can negotiate in a much better arrangement. We move individually, we'll be too small for us. So we are determined to use this era, controlling climate change, electric cars to the maximum but we need to mobilize capital. We need to work together so we can deal with expensive poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, I could say more, but we have made the point that we have work to do. We mobilize resources, working with donors, in a different way, but better way, working with private sector, our own private sector. I must confess here that what I inherited and found in government is that there's a tendency by leaders on our continent to demonize businesses. I just don't understand. I was a little business person before seeking politics. It was possible for me to go through a very difficult political environment, legal environment, because I learned the rope of doing things and surviving from business. How is it now, now that I'm president, I can demonize business? How do you create jobs? Why do we go to donors? We're looking for something, isn't it? So, so charity begins at home. Business, African business, family, individual, family, corporate, is part of our assets. We must work together in a manner that delivers value, mutual benefits for all. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say something about where we are. The Holocaust Center, where we are today, thank you for hosting us. This is a spectacular venue. The lesson that your center, our center, this center, teaches us is that tyrant 
hatred, genocide, and other negatives, I had bitter way. I listened to this lady when she was talking. Where is she? Thank you very much, madam. The Holocaust happened. The world said it will not happen again. And it, it happens in the few, full view of the world. As you rightly put it, Rwanda came. Things are happening in our countries, in our backyards. Things that should not be allowed to happen. When we do those things, they take away our eyes from fighting poverty, from investment, from capital mobilization, from working with the donors in a better way to better the lives of our people. So I repeat, the lesson that we learn is that tyrant, hatred, genocide, other negatives are just a heartbeat away. Unless we strengthen our openness, accountability, transparency, and respect for one another. Respect for one another as human beings. To Baba, thank you for what you have done. For your lifetime of service, and for what you do for us, for Zambia, and indeed others, is commendable. I hear people saying, we'll follow in your footsteps. It's very difficult to follow in his footsteps. Very difficult. But we shall strive. To Jonathan, Nick, Madam, Long live. May you continue to fund African democracy, African aspirations, among your many economic and social undertakings. But thank you. And to that fellow there, Greg, I wonder if you ever thought it would come to this. It would come to this point when we met those many years. Holiday Inn in Lusaka. You remember the weaver beds? They were there. I don't think you ever thought it would come to this. But we are here. We are proud of your work. And we will continue to tap into your wisdom and knowledge in the years ahead. As always, we should continue to work to make things better and get things done. I have an issue back home, that because we're in government now, because I'm a public servant now, I must not push for things to be done. No. We will push for things to be done. Because only when we push for things done will things get done. So thank you, Greg. We want to encourage leaders in our governments and other governments to read this book. I also want to encourage others outside government, public sector, private sector, everywhere. Let us read this book. And indeed, act on the lessons. Act to avoid reinventing the wheel. And I think we'll be better people, communities, countries, continent, and the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening. I'm very privileged to have the author of the book as my boss. I learn a lot from him, much more than he knows I'm learning from him. So I'm learning them secretly. <laughs> so you, can you please help me welcome to the podium Dr. Greg Mills. President Hichalima, President a Bassinger, Your Excellencies, Premier, wherever he is, Ministers, I'm not sure whether Ministers come before Premiers. I'm not sure what the uh, protocol pecking order is. Um, I know what they'd like to be, but Ministers, 
particularly the Minister of Defence and Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Zambia. I was very interested to learn that you're both economists. You both have an economics background. I think that says probably more than one can say about the focus of your government. To the leaders of the oppositions that are present, John Steenhuisen, Nelson Chamisa of the CCC, now rebranded, and Bobby Wine. Where are you, Bobby? The mayor of Johannesburg, my wife, my many bosses, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests. The reason why I didn't tell President to make to, that he was going to make a speech is that he would have prepared one and spoilt it. Sadly, I don't have his ability, so I had to write down a few <laughs> notes. There are many reasons, of course, for writing a book on aid, and let me briefly share a couple of them, and then I want to briefly turn to just two of the conclusions. This is a book about the personal learnings of 30 years. It's about multiple deployments with governments in very different settings, literally from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. It's on deployment with governments, and it's with interveners aid agencies, in another term, in different capacities. It's through the friendships that one makes over many years. The aid environment is also a highly polarized environment. But there is a common thread here, which is that there's a clear questioning academically and increasingly among policymakers about its utility. You see this, for example, in the creation of the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in the United Kingdom, an amalgam, much controversial amalgam, but one that's a response to this debate. There's also been an extraordinarily large amount of money given, $1.2 trillion, I calculate, since the end of the Cold War, but much less to show for, the, for it than that money would indicate. And there are even greater volumes of private aid, perhaps double that again, flowing to Africa. It's not just Africa, of course, that's a recipient of aid, but it is disproportionately Africa. There are a whole bunch of new donors out there. They're new donors who highlight old challenges, but they also raise new problems, not least about transparency and how money is spent, but how much of it is traditional aid in the form of grants, and how much of it is loans. And what you've seen increasingly, and Zambia, sir, is testament to this, is an increasing stock of debt held or issued in a highly opaque manner. The book was also motivated, and I have to point this out, particularly in the presence of oppositions. Tendai, it's lovely to see you here too about an awareness of the relationship between conditions of democracy, of better governance, of diversification economic performance, and parallel concerns about democratic regression in Africa after a period of relative democratic expansion. This is despite the record of the relationship, the correlation between development and democracy, and despite the preference of the majority of Africans for a democratic system. This book was also motivated by the use increasingly of so-called strategic aid. I have to confess, as President Abbasanjo pointed out, it was motivated by the terminology of Africa beyond aid, or Ghana in this instance beyond aid, and the work that we did for President Nana Kufo Addo. But it was also motivated by an expression I heard Bobby Wine use. I hadn't even met him. And I was at a conference with President Abbas and Joe in the UK just before COVID paralyzed us all. And someone at the conference said, when Bobby Wine went to the United States, he said, when he was asked, 
what should the United States do? He said, don't fund our oppressor. In other words, do nothing rather than what you're doing. And this, this is, of course, driven by a strategic premise in terms of the, the donor's best interests rather than the country or the people's best interests. And it raises very important questions about the necessity of countries and governments not, in crude terms, to be a cheap debt. I also wanted to share country successes. This is not a highly dystopian book which is going to lead to you slitting your wrists at the end of it. It's really a book about how things can be changed, as Tully has pointed out, by choice. And there are many examples of success in the book from countries as diverse as Colombia and Somaliland. And the last really key reason for writing this book is because Africa's changing demographic circumstances demands fundamentally a change to business as usual. We're going to double our population in Africa over the next generation when most Africans will live in cities. And this figure, of course, 60 years ago was just 10%. But Africa's share of global per capita GDP has halved from 30% to 15% over the last 60 years. Whereas Asia's, by comparison, and President Debussinger used this example, has tripled to near parity with the global average of $10,500 today. Robert Louis Stevenson once said that sooner or later we all sit down to a banquet of consequences. If we don't end business as usual, we will suffer that banquet of consequences rather than benefit from the opportunity that changing demographics potentially portends. Now, I'm not going to rehearse the book and you saying thank God for that in your presence, since I hope you're going to buy it. But rather, I'm going to talk just about two of the findings and very personal findings uh, which led or to some of the conclusions, but also led to me writing it. The first of these is that it's been a remarkable treasure in this job, which I have to say has been made possible by the generosity and, dare I say it, the prescience of my employers, that I've been able to pursue two of life's great pleasures, at least great pleasures for me. And the first of these is to travel, to meet people in all walks and stations of life to hear their stories, to understand their fears, to appreciate their aspirations and dreams, and to listen to them, and to use my ears, eyes, and mouth in the ratio that God gave them to me. I met Gavin Relly, uh, must be pff, nearly 30 years ago, at a, a banquet, not the Stevenson type, but a banquet held at the Rosebank Hotel and I was seated next to him. They must have made a mistake. This must have been about 92, 93, just before great change in South Africa. And I was my usual sort of bolshy self, opinionated, giving people a hard time, telling them what, where they should get off. And he quietly said to me, you know, one of the great things I've learned in life is to ask the people next to me about them, next to wherever he was sitting, about themselves. People always like talking about themselves. And it was a very big lesson because I suddenly realized I've been talking about myself, not listening to other people's stories and hearing about their fears, aspirations, thoughts, insights, and so on. And this has led to a journey which, of course, has taken in the likes of President Abbasinger. We met in a passport queue, and I turned to him and asked him a question. And he must have thought, who the hell is this guy? It was in Sao Paulo, now almost a decade and a half ago. HH is much the same. He's told you, sorry, President HH, I have to get used to that. It's, <laughs> it takes some, um, takes some adjustment, let me say. Um, and Tendai and others. These are relationships built and forged and people that I've listened to over many years. The second great pleasure in life is to read. We never, all of us, have enough time in this driven multimedia world that we inhabit. 
I used, for example, much to my wife's chagrin, my holiday period this last Christmas to read a dozen books. I set, set myself a target of a dozen books, mainly non-fiction. And in several of them, and you can guess the themes as a consequence, the name of General Alexander appeared in the context of a model for leadership. He was the epitome in the world of high command where ego and personal ambition often went, or too often went hand in hand, of having very little of the former ego and almost none of the latter. He was not a highly driven or ambitious man. By contrast, he had been brought up to respect notions of honor, duty, and it is said, impeccable manners in all things and at all times. Now, I've also read a book called My Command, which is by somebody in this room dressed in a similar color shirt to myself, which is also about those long-held and deep traditions of honor, duty, and service. But in the case of General Alexander, he was, through brilliant diplomacy, among other attributes, especially brilliant diplomacy with his American allies, and I apologize to the Americans present, to accept his ideas as their own, making them think that they had thought of it themselves. What an incredible art. What an incredible skill set. Such was a command style, particularly suited to multilateral operations, in the environment in which we operate today of the sort that we all face in this hyper-globalized world. And Alexander always led by example. He was always getting out there. President Abbasinger had just come back from Ethiopia. He diverted from his peacemaking mission in Ethiopia. I know that President HH is always out there seeing things for himself. And I think it was somebody else in this room who once said to me, your eyes never lie and he's making sure that his eyes never lie. And if you tour the front and you make the necessary dispositions, you will get to the truth just as General Alexander did. What does all this mean? It means that the human dimensions of leadership and relationships are critical, since the challenges for outsiders, and I include myself in this, is not to tell people what to do, and even less to tell them what they are doing wrong. That's not going to work. That's not the way that General Alexander got General Mark Clark to do the right thing in Italy in 1944. He made General Clark believe it was his idea, and that's how they were able to operate in parallel. To do this, you have to build the relationships that enable things to change. And this is a lesson in my friendship with President Hichilima through thick and thin, and for South Africa and other countries beset by division and an absence of trust across races, religions, tribes, ge geographies, and between the public and the private sectors as well. And we're reminded by this venue of the costs of getting that task wrong. You mentioned that you were in Yola. Interestingly enough, President Abbasanjo took me to Yola a couple of years ago to watch the turbaning of uh, his former vice president. But the bit I didn't realize is when we were sitting in the governor's residence and he was very chilled as he normally is, if you mind me saying so, sir, and we were having multiple discussions, very Nigerian, 20 discussions happening simultaneously, um, that he told me that he was incarcerated for two and a half years next door to the governor's building. And that for me is a reminder of not only the need for reconciliation, but the importance of not getting things wrong and the importance of displaying leadership in those circumstances. The second issue I wanted to talk about is the need for strategic leadership to problem solving. And I will just briefly say, we lack strategy. We don't think about things over the long term. We don't apply resources and timelines and priorities to the things that we want to do as a general rule. We search for magic elixirs, magic formulas, models that we can follow just like that, and everything is going to turn around. 
The advice that suggests this is just wrong and should be disregarded. Each circumstance is different, nothing can be replicated, and context and complexity is part of the solution. You need a strategic playbook, it needs to be highly differentiated, but local ownership, as President Hichilima has pointed out, of the problem and of the solution is absolutely key. Giving away money is the easy part, and, but it also affects the power relationship. I did four deployments in Afghanistan. I was there the month before President Ghani's government uh, collapsed. It's an extreme example of this. Nobody went to Afghanistan on a social visit, or maybe a few crazy people did, but working there effectively illustrated perfectly this point about the distortions that happen in the power relationship when money becomes the method of transaction, it becomes the currency that is overwhelmingly utilized to describe the relationship. We also need to think about, and I was reminded of this by Jonathan and by President Hichilima's inputs, we need to think about a moral economy. Development is much more a much greater encompassing term, particularly today in the environment of climate change and other concerns. It's much more than just about a financial bot bottom line. And then for governments, perhaps, and I've heard this in your speech, so perhaps the key lesson of growth and development for governments and their peoples is that it's fundamentally a Zen story. What do I mean by that? Simply, if you want to be free, all you have to do is let go. And part of this is really about letting go, about not trying to control everything absolutely to your chest. Let me conclude. I'd like to thank my publishers. Uh, Terry Morris is here, Sally Hines, Andrea. Um, there's no more efficient and unflappable bunch of colleagues, uh, even on the... I don't know, what was it, 25th re-edit, rewrite of various sections. My Brenthurst colleagues, Ray, Murray Noel, Henry, Leila, Haroon, Miriam, and Richard Morrow and Emmanuel uh, in particular. And of course, Jonathan and Nikki for having the confidence in the work of the foundation. I hope that the last 17 years has been worth the pain, Jonathan, of trying to manage me. And to HH, you have a very difficult inheritance. You've made that very clear. <clears throat> but there's simply no better person for the job. As Zambians, finally, were permitted to demonstrate in their choice last year. Thank you for displaying tenacity and for providing hope. And I'm sure I speak for the, elect the opposition members that are here, for providing hope in election processes. Because if you lose hope that they're going to actually deliver what you vote for, <laughs> the cost of that lack of trust is considerable. And thank you for your friendship in making the journey to be with us today. Let me end with Rudyard Kipling's observation about the role of his six honest men. What and why and when, how, where and who. Any process of investigation, of analysis, of recommendations of the sort that are contained in this book needs to ask these questions to understand why things happen and why also they don't happen. It's probably as important as understanding what is needed to make things happen as understanding why they haven't already happened. We need to understand, for example, what it will take to get investors to invest. Ask them. You might actually find the solution. We need to be clear about what constraints exist and why and what the effect of external involvement and interference and money is on these factors. I hope you enjoy and more than that are challenged by expensive poverty. And I have to just add something here. I was really battling for the right title for this book, and I do think it's uh, the right title, and I'll tell you why I think that in a moment. But I was, had all sorts of 
offers all sorts of ideas. We had a round table in Somaliland. We led an election observer mission to Hargesa and to Sheikh and Berbera and Baral and other places you won't have heard of. And um, we came up with multitudes of ideas in the group and a seminar that we ran. And then I spoke to Bobby uh, while transiting through Tanzania's airport, which is a forgettable experience, at least in, Mom, uh, in Zanzibar it is. And, and I said, I've, you, know, you know I've written this book on aid, because he collaborated in the song that goes with the book. And he said, ah, aid. He said, that's just another word for expensive poverty. Shall we give one more round of applause? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Greg Mills. It's been a very inspirational evening, um, but every good event ends too quickly. And uh, sadly, we've come to the end of the program. Uh, shall we call Mr. Jonathan Oppenheimer to give us a closing remarks? Thank you. I very carefully took a whole bunch of notes, but uh, President Hichilema, President Obasanjo, Greg, all expressed, I think, so detailed and so effectively a lot of the challenges that I'm not going to repeat them. Suffice to say, we have to find capital, we have to access that capital, and we have to deploy it in goods and services, to grow goods and services so the people in our countries can experience a better future, a better tomorrow than today. And so you're doing that. And to simply see the change in Zambia over the short time that you have been in charge is, is remarkable. The challenge, of course, is the one that you yourself articulated. This is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And you have to, you may have started as a sprint and you're doing incredibly well. There's another 40 odd miles to go. And uh, I'm confident you will find the way to carry on. And that is the challenge for all of us. We have to carry on. And we have to make every day another day of victory, another day of securing additional capital, another day of securing additional labor. And Africa has all the resources in terms of people. They may not be perfectly trained, but curious, committed, engaged people will learn the necessary skills to be successful. What Africa doesn't have access to is the capital necessary to employ that labor. That capital is here. We've been in a bizarre and perverse way blessed by the global financial crisis and COVID in that it has caused the world to print many trillions of dollars of capital, which is now available for Africa to offer opportunities to deploy it. So we are in this unique position where we can get capital and we need to go out and source it. And so what you're doing in driving Zambia's growth is exactly what we need to do, but not only in Zambia, not only in the Magic Seven, but across the entire continent. And I think it's the challenge for all of us to aspire not necessarily to five or seven percent growth, but double digit growth, and maybe even a lot more than that. So without further ado, Greg, you, you, you're going to give us the song. Is Bobby going to join or not? <laughs> oh, I, Greg Mills and uh, Expensive Poverty. Um, we'd like to, to play two songs. Um, we've had a little bit of a collaboration with Bobby, myself and Robin. And if you don't know Robin, he's uh, had a multitude of top ten and hits in South Africa. Um, and the collaboration with, with Bobby uh, started with Alone But All Together, which we wrote for COVID. And uh, it had 20 million views on YouTube, which uh, I tried to tell my children it had meant that we'd sold 20 million records, but they didn't know what records were. And then when they, I told them that, they said, you're joking. <laughs> Get serious, Dad. Um, and that went into the song for Asia and then the song um, uh, for the book, Expensive Poverty. But we want to play for you first, if we can indulge you for six minutes. Um, the first song, which is called Making Africa Work, which went with the book, um, Making Africa Work, written, among others, with President de Bussinger. Mm -hmm. 
From the dust of Mauritania To the feet of a thousand hills Was looking for you, Mama Where the mighty floodplain spilled Drifting down the insulate People on the move Like horrors in the sunset Looking for you too Oh mama, where do they come from? Oh mama, where do they go? Can you tell me where are you taking us? Mama Africa I need to know Head into the Great Lakes The warm heart, so they say Five loaves and two fishes There'll be no miracle today People come to the city Leaving their homes behind How you gonna get a better deal With hope so hard to find Oh mama, where do they come from? Oh mama, where do they go? Can you tell me where are you taking us, Mama Africa? I need to know. And if we can do it, then it can't be done. Walk it like we talk it, the way things should be done. And if we can do it, then it can't be done we'll Walk it like we talk it The way things should be run mm -hmm. The past is another country Tears fall from the sky The future is our choice to make Make us wings to fly Oh mama, where do they come from? Oh mama, where do they go? Can you tell me where are you taking us? Mama Africa Oh mama, where do they come from? Oh mama where do they go? Can you tell me where are you taking us, Mama Africa? I need to know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the next one we haven't really practiced. <laughs> and we certainly haven't practiced it with, um, with Bobby, but I wonder if we could tempt him to come up. Would you like to come up? Fantastic. Leave it. Thanks. Ah, man. I'm humbled. <laughs> President Ubasanjo, I'm humbled to be before you, sir an inspiration. It's not every day in Africa that we have a former head of state not living in exile, so you're such an example, <laughs> sir. And President Ishelema, I'm humbled to be before you, sir. You are a living example that is actually possible. Uh, all of us, especially my generation, have been watching you, watching the struggles you go through for the peoples of Zambia. Uh, like you rightly put it, from prison to president, and watching you swear in was a constant reminder that indeed it's going to be possible. And also, you remind us that the struggle, not only for Zambia, but all of Africa, is not just to become president, but again to get a chance to transform the lives of the people. And what you're doing for the people of Zambia, from healthcare to education, be sure, sir, that we're picking lessons from you. God bless you.
sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. So we, Bobby, I haven't seen him. Uh, since sometime last year, so we hope we can remember the words. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, he's the pro. Okay, we'll do that a couple of times wrong. Don't pay the oppressor money. He's taking everything he can. Ah. We've got to make our own plan. Yeah, man, we've got to make, make our own plan. Ah. If you want to help do no harm, if you want to help, don't empower his arm. If you want to help, look at the population. If you want to help, no linear equation. No more charity, it's a collaboration. A people want to eat, the feel of suppression. A people want to live, but they give us guns now. The will to be helpful, listen to be kind, listen to make a difference. Not out of mind. If you wanna help, do no harm. If you wanna help, don't empower his arm. If you wanna help, look at the population. If you wanna help, no linear equation, no more charity. It's a collaboration. Feed the world is what they say. But the beast, oh, the beast is who they pay. That's right, that's right. Happen on people, because we should not be afraid. So lift us from the shade, oh, let us not disagree. Say if, if you, you wanna, wanna help, help, oh, oh look at oh, 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 oh. If, if you wanna, wanna help, don't empower his arm. <laughs> if you wanna help, I look at the population. If you wanna help, no linear equation, no more charity. It's a collaboration. Big men, cheap behavior, oh, yeah. cold hearts, I say full of corruption, we are on savior, dollars in the pockets, puppets on the strings, they keep play and we pay, say if you want to hail, do no harm. If you want to help, don't temper why he son. If you want to help, do have a population. If you want to help, no linear equation. No more charity. It's a collaboration. Yeah. My, my <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Bobby. My children would say that's why he's a singer, not you, Dad. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. May I say a protocol observed to recognize all the dignitaries present one more time. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, we've come to the end of tonight's ceremony. The books are downstairs. Uh, please buy more than you can carry. <laughs> okay. And there will be no media briefings by, the, by His Excellency. And there will be no media briefing by His Excellency President Obasanjo as well. Um, they'll be departing straight from the venue at the end of this, this function. Thank you very much for coming and have a lovely evening for what is left of it. Thank you. <laughs>